pancreas cancer. This is one of a series of videos that can be found on the website aboutcancer.com. Pancreas cancer remains one of the most serious malignancies. In 2014, there were 46,000 cases, or 2.8% of all cancer. And because the outcome is so poor, this accounted for almost 7% of the cancer deaths. The five-year survival is still poor. It's only 6.7%. The lifetime risk of ever developing this cancer is 1.5%. This cancer is a bit more common in men than women, but only slightly as noted. The age distribution is shown here. Most patients are in the 50, 60, 70 age group. Median age is 71 for this disease. The cancer is a bit more common in men than women, as noted, and more common in African Americans than whites. The trend over the last 30 years is fairly stable. The number of new cases may have increased only slightly. The mortality has been stable. The sad truth is the five-year survival in 1975 was 3%, and in 2006 was only 7.3%. So this is a malignancy in search of better treatment options. If you look at the national statistics here, the so-called SEER database, you would see that only 9% of the cases are local at the time they're diagnosed. And even in this favorable group, the five-year survival is only 26%. Most patients present with more regional or distant disease, and the five-year survival was very low as noted. The risk factors for developing pancreas cancer include smoking, obesity, a history of diabetes or chronic pancreatitis, a family history of pancreatic cancer or pancreatitis, and certain somewhat rare hereditary conditions. The symptoms of pancreas cancer include pain, weight loss, or jaundice. Tumors in the head of the pancreas are more likely to have jaundice and tumors in the body or tail of the pancreas more likely to have pain or weight loss. The pain is often in the abdomen, but quite commonly in pancreas cancer, the pain can radiate into the back. If you look at the bile made in the liver, bile is a yellowish fluid produced in the liver. It aids in the digestion of fat in the small intestine. The bile has to make its way through the hepatic ducts into the common bile duct and pass through the head of the pancreas to get into the duodenum where the bile is used to help digest food. If there's a tumor in the head of the pancreas, it can easily pinch off the common bile duct and cause blockage in this area. And the bile will back up into the gallbladder or back into the blood supply and cause jaundice. If the pancreatic duct is blocked, this also can affect uh, digestion because the pancreas enzymes won't get into the intestine and this could also cause pancreatitis and other pain. And here's another image showing a cancer in the head of the pancreas that's putting pressure and obstructing both the common bile duct and the pancreatic duct. Cancers in the body or tail of the pancreas are less likely to cause obstruction but more likely as noted to show up with pain or weight loss. The symptoms of pancreas cancer are many and are listed on the next slide. The most common would be weakness, weight loss, and loss of appetite. Abdominal pain is common. Epigastric pain, which means pain in the pit of the stomach, is common. Dark urine and yellow jaundice is related to the obstruction. Nausea and back pain are also quite common. And then finally, diarrhea, vomiting, fatty stools or bowel movements and even rarely thrombophlebitis or unexplained blood clots in the legs can have to be a symptom of pancreas cancer. The signs of pancreas cancer or the things that would be noticed by a doctor are listed on the next slide. That would include yellow jaundice, an enlarged liver, or a mass in the upper abdomen. Obviously, cachectia, which means wasting away or a significant weight loss. Cavoisier sign, which is an odd thing, but it's the finding of a non-tender distended gallbladder that the physician can feel. Another epigastric mass, again feeling a lump in the stomach, or even ascites abdominal fluid in the abdomen. The biopsy is critical, obviously, in any malignancy. The pathology in pancreas cancer is almost always adenocarcinoma in at least 85% of the cases. 
95% of all pancreas cancers arise in the exocrine elements of the pancreas, which means the cells that are involved with making digestive enzymes. About 5% of pancreas cancer cells arise in the endocrine cells of the pancreas, and this would lead to odd cancers such as neuroendocrine, islet cell cancer of the pancreas. The endocrine cells are cells such as the, those that make insulin and other hormones. The pancreas can be divided into different parts, most commonly the head, the body, and the tail, based on the location relative to certain key blood vessels like the portal vein and the aorta. The lower part of the head is called the uncinate process, and there is a small area called the neck. These are shown in this diagram. Cancers most commonly occur in the head of the pancreas, as noted in this image. If you look at the statistics overall, 60 to 70 percent of cancers will be found in the head of the pancreas and about 20 to 25 percent in the body, tail, or remainder of the pancreas. Tests used to evaluate and stage pancreas cancer are listed. We often start with routine blood tests such as a liver product such as bilirubin that would be elevated. And so-called tumor markers, the most well-known would be CA19-9 or CEA. These are chemicals that only rise in the blood in patients who have cancer. The imaging studies are many, CAT scans, MRIs, ultrasound, and PET scans. Endoscopy is important in diagnosing this disease, either ERCP or endoscopic ultrasound. And then finally, a laparoscopy and some type of biopsy are important. The CA19-9 is a specific blood test called a tumor marker. It's quite sensitive and specific. Sensitivity ranges from 70 to 92 percent, and meaning if a patient has pancreas cancer, this test will be elevated in 70 to 92 percent of the cases. And specificity is said to be 68 to 92 percent, which means if the CA19-9 is highly elevated, it's very likely the patient has cancer. Also, an unresectable patient is much more likely to have an elevated CA19-9. If the level is very high, then the odds are even greater that the patient's disease will be unresectable. The uh, CA19-9 can go up with other cancers, as noted. Pancreas cancer, biliary cancer, which would include gallbladder, hepatocellular cancer, other cancers, gastric, ovarian, and colorectal, occasionally can have an elevated CA19-9, and even lung cancer, breast cancer, and uterus, on rare occasions, this will be elevated. You can also see an elevated CA19-9 in people with benign diseases, such as acute cholangitis, which is an inflamed bile duct, or cirrhosis or other cholestatic diseases, which means gallstones or things that block the bile ducts. Ultrasounds are a very common test used to evaluate the gallbladder and the liver and the bile duct system. The sensitivity for detecting tumors in the pancreas is quite high, 89%, and the false positive rate is low, so the so-called specificity is quite high, again meaning if the ultrasound shows a mass in the pancreas consistent with cancer, the odds are very high that they do in fact have cancer. And this would be a picture of an ultrasound image showing a mass in the head of the pancreas and a dilated duct tubule. CAT scans are even more commonly used for evaluating pancreas masses. The sensitivity of a CT scan is very good, 89 to 97%, particularly with a high quality CT image. The sensitivity is obviously related to the size of the tumor. If the tumor is over, over two centimeters in size, the CT is almost guaranteed to find it. If the tumor is very small, less than two centimeters, the sensitivity was still good, but only 77% in one study. Endoscopy is very important in evaluating pancreas cancer, a so-called ERCP or EUS. Obviously, the gastroenterologist passes the endoscope tube down the patient's mouth and throat into the stomach and the duodenum and upper intestine. With an ERCP, or so-called endoscopic retrograde cholangiopancreatography, he tries to pass the scope all the way down into the duodenum and get inside the ducts of both the uh, common bile duct and the pancreas duct, and then inject dye into this duct system. 
and look for areas of imaging that show compression or squeezing of the common bile duct. ERCP has very good sensitivity, 92%, and specificity, 96%, meaning very reliable. At ERCP, the, the gastroenterologist can also attempt to biopsy the pancreas mass. The accuracy or sensitivity in picking up cancer, 50 to 60%, is not quite as good as endoscopic ultrasound, which is now being done even more frequently. And the uh, positive biopsies from an endoscopic ultrasound can be as high as 92%. So endoscopic ultrasound, they pass an endoscope down through the mouth into the stomach and the duodenum. There's an ultrasound tip at the end that gives a very detailed image of the region of the pancreas. And these are typical pictures that one would see at the time of endoscopic ultrasound, various tumors involving the pancreas or the ductal area. Endoscopic ultrasound techniques can be used also for pain control, where the doctor can inject the nerves or the celiac plexus with chemicals to numb up the pain. Endoscopic ultrasound can be used to place stents or tubes that go through the area of obstruction in the bile duct area and relieve the jaundice that the patient may have. CAT scans have been around for a while, but the quality keeps improving and the accuracy of picking up masses in the pancreas is now quite high. These are typical CAT scan images of masses in the pancreas. PET scans even better. The PET scan will light up or change colors the mass in the pancreas. And these can be very reliable in helping the radiation doctor perhaps target the cancer. And PET scans are very helpful if the cancer is already spread elsewhere in the body to the liver, lungs, or lymph nodes, or other regions. The staging system is called the TNM system. It's a measure of how far the cancer is spread. and talks about T for tumor, N for lymph nodes, and M for metastases. And all three things, the TNM scores, are then combined to get the stage. So for instance, a T1 tumor, a T1A, is a tumor that's two centimeters or less and confined to the pancreas. If the patient has a T1 tumor and no lymph nodes, they would be stage 1A. A T2 tumor would be a tumor larger than that, 2 centimeters, still limited to the pancreas. And this would be lead to a stage 1B cancer, as long as the lymph nodes are negative. In a T3 lesion, which is beyond the pancreas and is extended into other structures, such as the duodenum, as long as the lymph nodes are negative, a T3 patient would be stage 2A. Once the lymph nodes are involved, then the patient has stage 2B, as noted in this image. Finally, if the tumor is unresectable, a T4 cancer, usually because it's gotten into major blood vessels, then this will be stage 3. The blood vessels of interest include the superior mesenteric artery, the celiac axis, the common hepatic artery, and the portal vein and the pancreas area is very vascular. And these are images to show how the tumor is now compressing these important blood vessels. And finally, stage four pancreas cancer is if the cancer has spread elsewhere or metastasized to the liver, lung, or peritoneal cavity as noted. If you look at the national statistics from the National Cancer Database, or NCDB, Again, unfortunately, you can see very few patients are diagnosed at stage one and two. And even in that group, the five-year survival is poor. Most patients, unfortunately, are stage three and four, and the long-term survival is extremely low. And this graph shows the survival by year. And again, as noted, the median survival is less than one year, even in patients with stage one disease. The overall survival, the best chance for a cure is with surgery, but only 10 to 20% of patients are even candidates for surgery. And even in that group, the five-year survival is noted as only 20%. And the median survival is in the 13 to 20 month range. If the cancer is locally advanced and unresectable, the median survival in most series is eight to 14 months. And in the 60% of patients whose cancer is already spread or metastasized, median survival is typically only four to six months. The best advice on treating pancreas cancer can be found on the website of the National Comprehensive Cancer Network. 
This can be accessed at nccn.org. If you go to the pancreas guidelines, as I dictate this in 2014, they now have a warning that says decisions about management should involve a multidisciplinary consultation, which means a team, and ideally at a high volume center, that's a hospital or center that does a lot of pancreas cancer treatment. And they also emphasize after reference to appropriate imaging studies. So they're emphasizing how important it is to get good quality CAT scans or ultrasound imaging. There also are guidelines from the NCCN for patients, nccn.org slash patients. And these are much more patient friendly. In summary from the NCCN, they would say again, resection is the only chance for cure and resectable patients should undergo surgery without delay and followed by adjuvant therapy, which usually means radiation or chemo. And if it's borderline resectable, then the patient may benefit from neoadjuvant therapy, which means chemotherapy first, and then attempts at surgery. Surgery is often called a Whipple procedure. This is named after a Columbia surgeon who pioneered this back in the 1930s. The procedure has improved, obviously, over the last 80 years or so, but is still a very technically difficult operation. If the patient is not a surgical candidate, then they benefit from chemotherapy or chemo plus radiation. And if they have metastases, again, chemotherapy or radiation. Radiation is discussed on a separate video. Chemotherapy has been improving over the last few years. There are new drugs available such as Gemzar or Gemcitabine, Abraxane or protein-bound Paclitaxel, Tarceva, Aloxetin or Oxaliplatin, and Ironotecan or Camptasar. Some of these drugs are now useful in pancreas cancer. The common regimens combine these drugs in regimens such as Fulferinox, or gems are combined with Abraxane or even Orlotinib or Tarceva. There are statistics from recent trials. For instance, gems are was found to be better than 5-FU. Survival went from 4.4 up to 5.6 months or up to 6 or so. Then gems are was compared with Fulferinox. The survival with gems are was 6.8 months and Fulferinox 11 months. And then Gemzar was uh, compared to Gemzar plus the Braxane. And again, the survival was 6.7 months up to 8.7 months. Overall, if you look at the survival curves with Fulferinox versus Gemzar or Gemzar or Braxane versus Gemzar, unfortunately, the overall survival is still poor. And so this is a disease in need of newer, more aggressive or effective targeted drugs. More information can be found about pancreas cancer on the website aboutcancer.com.